Thank you so much for attending this evening. We really appreciate it. And a special thank you to UPS for sponsoring tonight's event. So thank you very much for being such good friends and community partners. Um, so I hope tonight, tonight is about learning, connecting, and sharing. So, you know, once we hear from the speakers, you know, have questions, ask questions, be part of the conversation. Um, so before I introduce each of our speakers, we're going to hear um, a TED talk about grit, and um, I will play that, and then I'll come back and introduce Rose. Sure. When the work came back, I calculated grades. What struck me was that IQ was not the only difference between my best and my worst students. Some of my strongest performers did not have stratospheric IQ scores. Some of my smartest kids weren't doing so well. And that got me thinking. The kinds of things you need to learn in seventh grade math, sure, they're hard ratios, decimals, the area of a parallelogram. But these concepts are not impossible. And I was firmly convinced that every one of my students could learn the material if they worked hard and long enough. After several more years of teaching, I came to the conclusion that what we need in education is a much better understanding of students and learning from a motivational perspective from a psychological perspective. In education, the one thing we know how to measure best is IQ. But what if doing well in school and in life depends on much more than your ability to learn quickly and easily? So I left the classroom and I went to graduate school to become a psychologist. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study, my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling Bee and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods asking which teachers are still going to be here in teaching by the end of the school year. And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students? We partnered with private companies asking, which of these salespeople is going to keep their jobs? And who's going to earn the most money? In all those very different contexts, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence, it wasn't good looks, physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking with your future, day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon not a sprint. A few years ago, I started studying grit in the Chicago public schools. I asked thousands of high school juniors to take grit questionnaires, and then waited around more than a year to see who would graduate. Turns out that grittier kids were significantly more likely to graduate, even when I matched them on every characteristic I could measure. Things like family income, standardized achievement test scores, even how safe kids felt when they were at school. So it's not just at West Point or the National Spelling Bee that grit matters, it's also in school, especially for kids at risk for dropping out. To me, the most shocking thing about grit is how little we know, how little science knows about building it. 
Every day, parents and teachers ask me, how do I build grit in kids? What do I do to teach kids a solid work ethic? How do I keep them motivated for the long run? The honest answer is, I don't know. <laughs> what I do know is that talent doesn't make you gritty. Our data show very clearly that there are many talented individuals who simply do not follow through on their commitments. In fact, in our data, grit is usually unrelated or even inversely related to measures of talent. So far, the best idea I've heard about building grit in kids <clears throat> is something called growth mindset. This is an idea developed at Stanford University by Carol Dweck, and it is the belief that the ability to learn is not fixed, that it can change with your effort. Dr. Dweck has shown that when kids read and learn about the brain and how it changes and grows in response to challenge, they're much more likely to persevere when they fail because they don't believe that failure is a permanent condition. So growth mindset is a great idea for building grit, but we need more. And that's where I'm gonna end my remarks because that's where we are. That's the work that stands before us. We need to take our best ideas, our strongest intuitions, and we need to test them. We need to measure whether we've been successful and we have to be willing to fail, to be wrong, to start over again with lessons learned. In other words, we need to be <coughs> gritty about getting our kids grittier. Thank you. So what did everybody think? Good? Did you know that already? I just need, I need to get organized first. <laughs> so um, that really hits home because I do think that um, when you really talk to people in their their careers and their profession, they talk a lot about failures and those how they learn from those failures and how they pick themselves self up. And I've seen in my own life the those personally and professionally who are able to kind of get knocked down and get back up faster do a lot better. So that's why this topic is so interesting to me and, and the panelists, and I'm, I'm delighted that they could all be here tonight to share some of their experiences. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Rose Scalabrini. She's from UPS. She's a lead system business analyst, UPS, um, and she's from UPS. Bridget Clark, who is an alum. She's a marketing and communications professional. Rockland Bosey, is that right? Yeah. So she graduated in 2004, so thank you for joining us. Suzanne Keith is a founder and CEO of Hello Career Guru, so thank you. And Rosalie Pickacomi, is that? Pajo. <laughs> <laughs> Business Relationship Manager at UPS, and Tina Thompson, General Manager of Operations at Flomo with Corporation. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction, and welcome everyone to the discussion of Power of Grit and exploring what it means to you. Before we get started, I do want to mention that we have HR here, and they have information uh, on internships at UPS, so if you're interested, please visit the table uh, in the back there when we break for networking. Okay? Um, so, oops. Don't know how that happened. <laughs> Okay, I want to share my background with you. I just celebrated 30 years at UPS. Mm -hmm. My undergrad degree is in IT, and um, IT has exploded in my lifetime. When I did programming back then, it was on key punch cards, and now you're, the power of computing <clears throat> is in the palm of your hands, mm -hmm. so it's amazing. Um, this is my first year at UPS. I went out for management training, we go out on district experience. You get to meet with, um, out in the field, all of uh, the different operations. 
so that you understand our core business from the ground up. So this was a great experience for me, and I got to meet uh, customers, too, in delivering packages and being at uh, our customer counter. So when you graduate, you know, I thought, hey, I'm going to wear my suit. You know, I'm going to IT and work in an office. And then opportunities come your way and like, wow, I'm wearing the browns delivering <laughs> packages. So, you know, grit to me is uh, that opportunity that comes to you in your everyday scenario and what happens to you every day and being open to those opportunities. Uh, personally, uh, my parents are from Italy. They actually met here. And so I'm a first generation Italian American. English was not my first language. So I started school. We didn't have preschool like we do today. So I started kindergarten not speaking English. So I know a little bit too of the obstacles of learning a language and being able to you know, speak and write in a different language. Um, on the next screen, I uh, want to talk about the definition of grit. So we looked up grit in the uh, dictionary online. So interesting enough, like the first three really talks about the abrasive material, right? The sand, the gravel, the grittiness. And lastly, you see the definition of courage in your inner strength. But to me, really grit and leadership is all of that. Um, grit is a lifelong journey, and your path is not smooth. You are going to come across that abrasive material, those pebbles, stones, the hills, the mountains that you're going to climb in your journey. So to me, grit is not about uh, the you know, um, amazing performance, the big win, your award. It's really what happens to you and your everyday life and your journey and choices that you need, need to make and what path you're going to follow. Secondly, what grit means to me is grit can be learned. Okay, this is my daughter. <laughs> this is my daughter in middle school. She's in college now. So at the time she came home, middle school, I hate math. And really I couldn't even help her with math. Math was so different from when I learned it. So I had a revelation, you know, when she said I hate math, I said to her, I know why you hate math because it's not easy for you. You need to figure it out. There, it's not an easy answer. You need to break it down and spend hours to try to figure it out. So I'm sure you're dealing with subjects, you know, replace math with anything else you're dealing with today, science, you know, programming, any of those subjects, or where you're at in your professional life, or relationships. So I spent time with her to sit down and look at what resources she had available to her to learn math. And to me, it was not just about learning math, it was really about a life lesson. When you encounter something difficult, and listen to yourself, become self-aware. When you say, I hate math or something, why is it that you hate it? Is it because it's not coming easy to you, and it's not an easy answer, and you actually have to spend time trying to figure it out? So on a Saturday, I have to say, we spent hours, I helped her looking at websites, and videos on uh, breaking down the math problems. Really, we wanted to go shopping. That's what we really wanted to do and have some fun, right? But we spent hours and I helped her to do this so that no matter what she encountered in her you know, journey, is that she knew how to break it down, how to figure it out. That's the hard part. Yes, you may you know, hate something or it's difficult to try to figure it out, but how do you figure it out, right? So there's many resources available to you. You know, the power of the internet is amazing. You can look up anything. And there's videos and websites that you can go to. There are your professors, uh, teachers, uh, advisors, you know, if you're at work, any of the managers. So use those resources. Tap into the knowledge and the experience, and that will help you uh, in your journey. Okay, lastly, um, we're celebrating Women's History Month in March, and um, Rosalie and I, and the girls in HR too, we're part of the Women's Leadership Group, and it's more than just really about women, it's about leadership, and it's more than just about gender or 
um, you know, race or religion. It's really about every, each of us supporting each other in our journey of leadership. So I want to share um, this um, film. I'm not sure if you're familiar. It's a League of Their Own celebrating the 25th anniversary this year. And this is a, a little known uh, part, chapter of American sports history. When our men were fighting overseas during World War II, we had a shortage of men in the professional baseball league. And the Cubs owner uh, came up with a, a brilliant business, a creative idea, to recruit women to play in this all-American girls professional baseball league. So this film was a star-studded uh, cast at the time. Penny Marshall directed and produces the film. Tom Hanks is the coach. John Levitz is the scout. And uh, the players were Madonna, Rosie O'Donnell, and Gina Davis. So I want to set up this scenario because I, this quote truly uh, exemplifies what grit is. So in the film, one of the players, Dottie, she's played by Gina Davis, um, was very frustrated with baseball. It was hard, and she really just wanted to go home. And that happens to all of us when we find something difficult or hard. You know, we want to walk away and just go home. So the quote from the film that the coach used, Tom Hanks, he said, it's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. So that's what I believe that grit is. And I also believe that grit means something different to each of us. And it might also mean something different in your journey, wherever you are in your point of career or education, wherever you are in your life. Okay, so with that, uh, we're gonna transition to the panel discussion. Uh, we have a list of prepared questions. Each panelist will introduce themselves and give you their background and answer the questions that we have prepared for you. And then at the end, we'll have um, a question and answer. Okay, so first, Tina. If you could introduce yourself and answer the first prompt, which is, what is grit and why does it matter? Thank you. Um, I'm Tina Thompson, and I like to think of myself as a change agent. Um, I have other roles that I fill as well, but what gets me out of bed in the morning is to see how much influence I have to bring about a positive impact on the lives of others. Uh, for many years, I got out of bed in the morning to earn. I am a single parent and uh, I wanted the best for my son. The time did come when he started to earn more than I did <laughs> and I needed a different purpose. So that's who I am. Um, in essence, I do also um, run two businesses. Uh, I'm general manager of both, so I'm busy during the day. I'm an executive coach, and um, I also am the honorary U.S. ambassador for an organization called Female Wave of Change. And we do have a millennial board as well, if, you, if any of you are interested. So, to your question, um, I believe that grit is about resilience. And I use the word resilience in its true original meaning. It's an engineering term which was and is used to measure how much you can compress steel before it cracks. Okay, so they place massive weight on steel, and there is a point at which it's no longer resilient and it cracks. And of course, it's critical to do that as they build buildings and bridges and everywhere else they use steel. I use it um, to measure how many times you can be crushed and get up again. For me, that is the definition of grit and, of course, the definition of resilience. 
more than education, more than training, and more than any experience, it's a person's resilience that determines who succeeds and who fails. And this is true in a hospital ward, it's true at school, it's true in the workplace, and it's true in life. So resilience is critical, in my opinion. Very good, thank you. Uh, for our next question, Suzanne, if you could introduce yourself and answer the following question. Why is it important to have small goals that can be achieved, as well as long-term goals? Hi, I'm Susanna Keith, and I'm very honored to be here with this wonderful panel. Thanks for having me. And I um, am founder of Hello Career Guru, and how I got there was as a tech startup, is I had a career for 25 years in brand marketing, working for Revlon, Estee Lauder, and then was always very involved in our community as a mother, and got involved in some not-for-profits there. I started a new not-for-profit when our local hospital went bankrupt, and that led me to a career as deputy mayor of my town, which was very interesting to run for an election. And I ran for a larger office, didn't win, but it was a great life experience. But where that led me to was that my, my co-founders and I, after many years in business, we were really amazed at the career trajectories of many women, and there were not more women in the C-suite. So we came up with an idea of how can we change this? What can we do different to encourage more women to be in leadership? And I started a group called Women in Innovation, which is basically a group of women that get together a couple times a year and talk about how can we innovate and help each other get to the C-suite. And while I was running that group, I did a survey and found that a lot of women did not know the right career path to get to the C-suite, whether it's a CFO or a CMO or a CEO, they needed help. Um, and men seem to kind of naturally figure out the way to get there, whether it's being on the golf course and networking with someone or just being able to ask. I mean, when you look at, um, for example, LinkedIn, they'll do matching and they'll say, hey, you have 80% of the requirements for this job. A woman may say to herself, oh gosh, I don't have enough, I'm not gonna apply. But studies have proven that men are like, yes, I have 80% of the requirements, I'm applying for this job. So we need to do something to kind of train women and think about it in a different way. So that led us to found Hello Career Guru, which is a virtual career trainer to help women map out their best game plan. And yes, it will be for men at some point as well. Um, and hopefully it'll help more women get to the C-suite. So I took a real pivot from a marketing career to st starting a tech startup. And that's something that's really very different. Um, and we did a school called the Y Combinator School. I don't know if anyone's familiar uh, with that. If you ever watched the HBO show called Silicon Valley, anybody ever see it? It, that's all about kind of a model of what Y Combinator does to help tech startups get out of the gate. So we found a CTO and we're doing a beta right now, which means our startup technology. So really, like when you talk about short-term goals and long-term goals, those are absolutely critical because you need some good short-term goals to say, hey, I accomplished something. Like for our team, it was like, we're gonna build the technology, we're gonna build something called a beta that's not exactly what we want it to be, but it's pretty close. And so we've achieved that goal. And that made us feel like, wow, you know, we're really going somewhere. And then the long-term goal, of course, is to build the product and get you know, thousands of users and hopefully to make a lot of people um, happy and get them into larger roles. And that's our long-term goal. So I think what we need to do in society, especially with the future of work, because we don't know what's really gonna happen in the age of robotics or artificial intelligence, is really make sure that we have short-term goals and long-term goals so we can map out where we want to go in our career. We can feel successful because I think that's sort of what grit is all about. It's persistence, you know, sticking with it and seeing a need gap and addressing it and making sure that there's some ups and downs and sometimes things work out, sometimes they don't, but you've stuck with it and really gone out there to achieve your goal. Great, thank you. Okay, our next um, question is for Bridget. Bridget, if you could introduce yourself and answer the following question. How important is self-leadership and managing oneself in terms of working on a team and being successful in the workplace? 
Um, hello, everyone. My name is Bridget Clark, and as mentioned, I was sitting in your seats. Uh, the library didn't look this awesome uh, when I was here, especially the downstairs did not exist. Um, but uh, in my career, I currently am in the communications team at Rockland BOCES. Most of you, if you are a Rocklander, probably think of BOCES as just the career in tech ed, but it really is so much more, and that's part of what my job is, is to get the community to understand it's special education, it's professional development for educators, it's um, adult education, and as well as the, the career in technical. Um, I also support the East Rampla Central School District. So again, any of you who are local know that that's a very challenging district to be in. Um, and I handle all things communication, social media, websites, calendars, newsletters, etc. cetera. Um, I've been with that team about a year and a half now. Previously, I had worked in, in freelance doing marketing and communications. I worked at an advertising, advertising public relations agency up in Orange County for a time. I worked here uh, at Stack in the enrollment marketing office, and before that I worked at a bank. So I'm, I guess, the typical millennial. I stay somewhere for somewhere between three to five years, and then I move on. Um, but for me, that's really given me the opportunity to see a variety of different kinds of workplaces. I've been on teams. I've had to run solo. Um, I've had opportunities where it's just me and my boss and a lot of autonomy, and I've had you know, positions where I really needed to work collaboratively with others. And I think having grit allows you to be adaptable to those different workplaces. You will find um, on an internship or when you first graduate that you might not be in the ideal situation. Uh, how many of you have had to work on a group project? Just hands up. Okay. When you work on a group project, keep your hand up if you're the type of person that likes to take control and figure out who's gonna do what, delegate the tasks, okay. You don't have to raise your hand for this next part, but have you ever been on a team where there's just one person that doesn't do what they're supposed to do? Oh, are you being honest and saying that's you? Okay, awesome. Um, there, or you were just in a team you, that, would, that had that kind of person, okay. You don't wanna be that person, okay? I'm just being honest, and when when you talk about grit and you talk about autonomy and you talk about being a self-starter and having time management, and these are all these words that they throw at you when they want you to go into business, right? Those are the things you want to say in an interview. Well, I'm a self-starter and, and I work well with others. And like, well, what are you really? You have to have a little bit of all of it. Um, and for me and my experience, I've been on teams where I've had to have that collaboration and collaboration is really important. When you get out there and you're the youngest one on your team, which you will be, don't let that stop you from being a collaborative part of that team. Because the person that's been in the industry 10 years, 25 years, has something to learn from you as well, just as you have something to learn from them. I'm now kind of in that career where I've got people that are younger than me, I've got people that are older than me. I respect both levels, because you have to respect everyone on your team for what they have to bring to the table. That being said, you also want to be a strong member of that team so that if you're given a task, complete your task the way you're supposed to. But if you've got extra time, use it wisely. Look into something else that you can collaborate to that team. One of the things, you know, in, at BOCES we are a team, so to speak, but we also run out and we kind of run our own show. And I like it because I don't have my boss in my office every day, I, I have a satellite place I have to go to, and when I was working freelance, I was working out of my own, in my own living room, kitchen, it's a condo, it's one big space. Um, and I, I really needed to have my own time management and be a self-starter. And what I try to do now is, it's not, oh, I have these five things to do today, and now I'm done with them, so I'm gonna go see what's on the Amazon flash sale. It's, okay, I've got some extra time, let me think about something I have to do a month from now or a couple weeks from now that maybe if I get started on, I'll save me some time in the long run. Or, you know, this is a problem we were talking about brainstorming in our staff meeting. Let me see if I can figure out the answer. And then share that with my team. Because we don't all have time in our days. Everyone has a full plate these days. Everyone is expected to do, you know, 150 things when they only have time for 100. And that is just the workplace, and I'm sure the ladies up here can agree with me on that. So how can you help somebody else? Because helping somebody else is only gonna help you in the long run. It, it gives everyone a positive 
view of you and who you are, and that will speak volumes for your long-term career. Great, thank you. Okay, Rosalie, if you could introduce yourself and answer the same question. Sure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rosalie Pachoon. Um, as Rose mentioned earlier, and also Jen mentioned earlier, um, I am a business relationship manager at UPS. I've been with UPS 33 years, so Rose and I kind of live like a, a double life. Um, I, as well as Rose, um, I actually was born in Italy, and I came here when I was six. Um, the challenges I had learning the language was a big struggle for me. Um, so I think that alone made me the person I am today. Um, with as long, as long as you have that self-leadership, I think there's many traits in self-leadership. And the three that I chose for myself, um, not when I was six, but I think as you mature in life, um, there's, there's three, three things that I saw. And one was self-assessment, um, self-awareness, right? So what, what am I doing? Like, what can I do better? What are my values? What are my intentions? Like, what are the, what are the things that push my buttons? What are the things that take me off track? Um, Self-confidence was a, another big area that I really focused on. And that was build yourself. Know what your, your, your um, abilities are. Know, know what your, your tick marks are. And keep building those because self-confidence will just keep building um, as you build those. Um, within my job, there's, I have been um, from uh, package operations, so I've had some engineering experience. I've had finance experience, so my, my major is in accounting, so that was what I thought I wanted to do in life. Um, as I progressed in a company like UPS, I, I know a lot of you have moved jobs, but I didn't have to move my in, within my company. I just moved from job to job. So. I went from engineering to supply chain to package operations to finance, and now I'm in IT as a business relationship manager. So within my, my job focus, I have to continue to learn, right? Learning will then help you even, even more, and I, I think that's a big thing. Continuous learning, you, you never stop learning. So when you graduate college and maybe you go on for a master's, after even a master's, you continue to learn every day, and I learn every day. Um, as far as um, using your resources around you, use everyone's expertise. Um, it's not just your knowledge, it's everyone's knowledge around you. Take that knowledge and build yours, and even share it with your team. Your team. I have employees um, that work for me, and I share my knowledge with them as much as I can. Um, another thing is provide value. So just like Bridget said, right, it's not what your tasks are for the day. You go way beyond what your tasks are for the day. Um, with all those traits, right, I, I know it's not something that happens overnight. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. So it took years and years of practicing them and, and having the will to continue and learn. Um, so I think once you come to a point where you're at your level or the pace the way you want it to be, I think you'll know like who you are once you get there. You know what you what you are, and then you also know where you're going to go. So with along with that, there's emotions, there's communication, there's behavior, and and it'll get you where you want to be with those with those skills behind you. Great, thank you. Okay, next, Bridget. Um, how important is working in a field or a position that you have an interest or passion for? Passion. So I'm someone that always is kind of told, you're running on empty. I'm always here and there and everywhere. I have a, an eight-year-old daughter at home. I have a husband that works nights. I have a full-time job. I volunteer at a local theater. I perform. I sang in a band for a time. So. I'm kind of that person that's always everywhere because it's just kind of how I roll, I guess. Um, but part 
of the reason I do that is because there's just so many things that I love to do. Uh, and I, I totally have FOMO. I don't want to miss the opportunity to do something that I really like to do just because I might not have the time to make it fit. So I try to figure out how to make it fit. And I try to put that same type of feel into what I do for a living. I've always been a talkative person. It's obvious, obvious as I'm up here on the microphone. Um, I like meeting people. Uh, I like getting out there and learning new things and, and finding out stories that are going on, which is why communications, public relations, and eventually marketing were where I fell in. Um, and I think passion about what you do kind of falls in two places. It's, it's part of you know, what it is that you're promoting or what it is that you're working on. And it's also the method in how you do it. Um, I've had jobs that maybe I really wasn't that interested about what the industry was. So my first job, actually, I got an internship through the Career Services Office. I think I see Maureen Mohan over there. Um, and that, was, that led to my first full-time job. It was at a bank. Now, I'm sure some of you accounting people, finance people, will be thrilled about that. But I was a marketing person. And a bank... Not that exciting. But I fell into public relations and employee communications. And for me, that was awesome. Because I got to go to the branches. I got to learn uh, what the people were doing, if they were out volunteering, if we were doing donations, uh, if there were any employee-centric um, you know, fairs or something that was going on. And I got to tell all the good news. So it might not be the interest rates that I had to focus on, but it was, it was the good stories. So that opportunity to tell someone's story was something that I love to do. So I, I, found, I found my niche there. And now I get to work in education, which for me, in this time of my life, I have an elementary school student. Even though I'm not in her district, it's kind of fun to see, oh, this is her world. Like, this is what she's doing every day. And obviously, she's my world, so there's my passion. Your passion will change, too. That's, that's the other part of it. If you graduate and you're like, this is what I want to do, and this is, this is for me, and then three years from now, you go, oh, this is not what I was hoping it would be. I don't really want to get up for work every day, or I'm not really, I thought I was going to love, you know, this cool, vibey place, or I really want, thought I really wanted to work for a big name company, and you realize that's not you, that's okay. You can, your passion can change based on all the other things that you have going on in your life. Your passions are going to change. So don't be afraid to change with them. And don't be afraid to find something that interests you every day because it's partially the people you work with. It's partially the message that you're putting out there or the work that you're actually doing. But it's also the methodology of how you're doing it. So figure out what it is that you love to do and try to insert a slice of that into what you get paid to do. Great. Thank you. Hey, Rosalie. Why are making mistakes such great learning tools? Okay, wow. Well, um, I think, you know, I think mistakes are inevitable. Um, mistakes makes who you are, right? You learn from your mistakes. So professional athletes make mistakes. Children make mistakes. Students make mistakes. We as employers make mistakes. Um, and the only thing I can say is really you learn from the mistakes. Um, take the feedback, accept it, work on it, adjust it, and then advance from it. So that, that's really how you learn, right? Um, I know, I was just talking to this with my daughter the other day. She's a freshman in college, and similar to Rose's um, situation with her daughter, she gets very frustrated with studying for an exam. But you know, you're going to make your mistakes when you're studying because she ta she's taking all these practice quizzes online and, oh, I'm, I'm never going to do well, I'm never going to do well, Mom. You are. Just keep practicing and practicing because once, once you're done and you know it, you feel accomplished. So um, I've made mistakes through life um, in my personal life and in my jobs, and I've had mentors at work. I've had leaders that have always kept me positive. I've, I'm a positive person, but to stay positive at times, especially in the workplace, gets you a little, gets you a little nervous. Am I going to lose my job? You know, are they going to think of me any less? Um, so I've had those key leaders that I've always looked up to um, and have taught me from my mistakes what I can do better. 
Um, and it's just a process. It's all a process. Struggling, frustration uh, is a process. Mistakes are a process. Um, I think growth comes from experience, and experience comes from ex mistakes. So um, I, I really think that it, it's very critical that, that you just take it with a grain of salt and just learn from it, and um, you, you'll, you'll just figure it out from there. Um, other than that, um, I think grit, you just really need to own those mistakes and just move forward. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Hey, Tina. Do you see resilience as being a quality that someone can learn or develop? If so, how? What small steps do you think you can take toward becoming more resilient? The answer is definitely yes. Um, you can learn. Um, and I liked your, your slide where you said it's a journey. So life is not fair. Okay? We have to get used to that. <laughs> um, as you leave this institution and go out into the, the big world, you will be faced again and again and again with crises, not only challenges. And as I said earlier, you, you have to build that muscle, which is resilience. Um, and, you know, my fellow panelists have spoken very eloquently and with great wisdom about the workplace. So I'm going to switch it up a bit and speak about personal life. Because no matter how brilliant you are and how well you've done at school, if your personal life is a mess, or something dramatic happens, it does affect every aspect of your life. And to maintain a job and to do it well under personal stress, you have to have resilience. So, how? The how is not easy. I do have a document which I'm more than willing to share. I'll, I'll email it uh, to Jennifer, um, where I have spoken about 16 different ways to develop um, resilience. And uh, Tina is a nickname. My, my real name is Fotini, and I'm Greek, and I've also had those challenges of, of learning the various languages. Um, I speak four languages, uh, and as you can hear, uh, I haven't been here in the U.S. for very long. So, you know, what does one pull on to, to build that resilience? It is a long journey, but you start with being still, okay? And the 16 Ps, that's pause, okay? Um, my real name is Fotini which starts with, with a P, P-H, like photo, does mean light. So the 16 Ps, they all start with the word, with the letter P. Pause is critical. It always has been, but in this day and age, where all of this overload of information, um, you know, we're addicted to action of all sorts. And if you don't take at least 15 minutes a day to be absolutely quiet with no input whatsoever, put those phones away. Um, you're gonna crash and burn, I'm telling you right now. And you know, I'm, I'm saying this with luck because life happens, okay? Relationships come and go. Illness comes and goes. Family members impact you. Their health impacts your own health. So there are many, many areas that you will be um, challenged with. So let's run through them very quickly. And as I said, you know, because I'm aware of the time, 
I will share the document um, if, if you're interested. Some of them are so simple and so, so self-explanatory, so I'm just going to read them, but in the document I do describe how to go about developing that. So, um, the first one is preparation. Okay, without being prepared, you're going nowhere. Um, partnership. You can't do this alone. You need a support system. Whether it is um, a loved one, or a teacher, or a mentor, uh, or someone from the clergy. You can't do this alone. You need support. Patience. I won't say a word. <laughs> um, performance. Are you proud of your performance day in and day out? Perseverance, persistence, passion. You have to be positive. It's not always easy, but you have to find the good in every situation because there is one. Perspective. It's not always about you. Ask the right questions and look into whether or not you have underlying beliefs and those are clouding your perspective. Be practical. Plan. Pleasing. Okay, a smile does wonders. Not only for yourself because of the chemical reaction, uh, physiologically, but also for those around you, and you are going to get um, much more support if you have a pleasing disposition. Purposefulness, you have to have a purpose. You have to be driven by a purpose. Philanthropy, do something for someone else. Volunteer. You heard how, you know, we've had people who started up nonprofits, people who are supporting their community. You always feel better when you help someone else. Because make no mistake, there's always someone worse off. Then there is the pause, and the final, and for me, the most important one is prayer. So you can develop resilience and you have to and please don't go about your life and depend on anyone you're on your own don't depend on your parents don't be, depend on your love partner don't depend on anybody and I have ten two-letter words for you if it is to be it is up to me. And if you hold on to that, you do survive, and in fact, you thrive. Tina, that was wonderful. Thank you. I'm looking forward to reading your paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Okay, next uh, we have Suzanne um, for the question of how important is building relationships and having mentors and building your confidence and resilience in the workplace. I think having a mentor is really critical, and it's something that I think what's really great is some companies are now starting to assign them because they realize the value, especially with women, um, to help them navigate the workplace, help them navigate corporate politics, have them navigate how to get to the next step. So really, I think when you're in the workplace, you want to try and find people that you can build great relationships with by finding things that you have in common, potentially leading a task force together, trying to do some great innovation for your company, or even like leading, leading the company softball team. You know, those kinds of things really help you to get to know each other. But I think that finding a mentor, and sometimes it's very helpful to have one in your company and sometimes outside your company. And one great place you can find that is probably through your university, you know, through potential alumni, you could, um, find someone to work with. And then in addition, you should also pick like what kind of company do you want to work for and who have you heard about in the news and potentially you can enlist someone like that to be your mentor. But I think also another really important thing that a lot of people are learning is you also need a sponsor. 
in your company, someone who is in a different area or potentially your area and not your immediate boss. I mean, if it's your immediate boss, that's great, but you need someone who will help catapult your career. They'll sit down with you and say, hey, I think you'd be great in this next business manager role. Will you be great in these other roles? And so I think it's really important to look at both having a mentor and then having a sponsor, because the sponsor will often be the one that will push you ahead, put in the good word, and really help you get the job done. Um, and I think by having these relationships and a mentor and sponsor, you build resilience. You know, you're able to handle, when I think of resilience, I think of it as handling the ups and downs day to day. Like for a good, a good example is in Hello Career Guru, we have a number of mentors. They're on our advisory board. We have the CEO of one of Hershey's divisions. We also have the CEO of J.K. Rowling's company, Rowling's company, you know, Harry Potter. And these women are our mentors and they're helping guide us. But then we also have people that are our sponsors. Because when you have a tech startup, you're going to need to go out and raise capital to go to the next level. So you need sponsors, people who will help you and help you find money in, the, in an environment like this, which is really exciting. Um, and so I think that that really helps you build resilience because you know there's ups and downs in finding the right person and having a relationship with those people. And sometimes they ask for a lot and you have to realize to say when you can say yes and when you can say no to what they're asking for. Great. Thank you. Hey, uh, Bridget, if you can answer the same question. Um, that, was a, that was a great answer in terms of mentors. Mentors are really, really important because they can help propel you. They can help be an advocate or a sponsor for you. Um, relationship building is important in business and outside of business. Um, and one of the things that I've really found to be helpful in building relationships is kind of that um, cross-departmental relationship. And you're talking about not just in your subject area, because sometimes in business, it's hard to get things done, um, and having an inside ear in another area of the company can be really effective if you need to know, um, you know, what's going on over there that's holding up a process, or you know, how, how can I get in the door with that person if I need to move something along? So making friends out, I won't say friends, but make, making relationships outside of your department is really is really effective um, to get some of those things done, and. In addition to building positive relationships, I do want to touch on one thing, and that's managing negative relationships. You will face people um, in your career that despite your best efforts at staying positive and being a team player and trying to be collaborative and supportive, they just aren't. Uh, and that can be really frustrating, especially if you think of yourself as a people person or a people pleaser and you're like, I'm just, doing, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do and I'm trying to help you and meet me halfway, please, and they just, they just won't. Um, but it's really important not to let that impact your own ability to be successful, but it's also important not to cut them out completely because you never know who you meet that is going to come back into your professional life at some point in time. Um, I graduated in 2004, so it's almost 15 years ago. But despite my, except for my first job, every single job that I've had before, and that includes all my freelance work, was all based on a relationship that I had built previously. It was either um, a boss that, you know, knew I had done great things and was friends with, an, let me go back and take the right path. When I, when our, when the bank sold, I lost my job, okay? I was like, oh my gosh, I'm getting fired. 25, what am I gonna do? I got the job here at the college because my boss here at the college knew me as a student and knew me as a very tenacious person and knew that I would be a good fit here for the college. Um, when I was looking for a bigger challenge, I was recruited by someone who had been on uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick's President's Council and was very good friends with um, Dr. Durney, if any of you had him in the past. And he advocated for me to get a job at the agency. When I wasn't happy at the agency and I wanted to leave and go freelance, I did more work here for the college as well as with other people that I had worked with um, at, at the agency on a private client basis. Then when I was looking for another job, it was because 
I was asked by a previous boss to be on a marketing committee, and it turned out someone there was looking for someone, and my new boss happens to be very good friends with my boss from here at the college. So everyone kind of talked to one another and knew who I was. I didn't know that this would be my path. I didn't know that the relationship I made as a 19-year-old um, you know, with the PR person here at the college would eventually lead to my job 17 years later. You never know. So the same with positive relationships goes with negative relationships. Just keep doing your thing. Don't let anyone get in your way. Don't let anyone get in, in the way of your positivity. If that's what you want to be, be a team player. Because they will realize your value eventually. And if you ever run into them again, they can never say, this person's not good to work with. Great, thank you. Uh, so thank you, everyone on the panel, for sharing your story. I think at this point, we're going to open it up for any questions. So if you want to direct a question to a specific panelist, or if you just want to put a question out in general, uh, feel free if you want to stand up and ask a question. I guess I'll stand up first. Great. <laughs> Um, so I guess my first question would um, be, what advice would you guys have for someone, this is very clearly about me, who is um, in their last semester of college and is debating if their major is what they want to do? Would like to take that first? I guess I, I can try. <laughs> I'm stuck with the mic. Um, you know what, I think that's, in some ways a really wonderful place to be because you have so much ahead of you that you have time to investigate if that is the major that you want to do. And maybe a great, uh, what is your major currently? Finance. Finance. So potentially, I would reach out to some alumni in, who are in finance, maybe like Bridget, who's been in the bank, and, and talk through with them like what is it like to be in finance and what kind of job is right for you. And then that way you can kind of pivot and see if you feel good about that role or not about that role. And then there's marketing, um, and then there's all sorts of you know, occupational nursing, et cetera, all sorts of wonderful things you can do. So I would kind of talk to your career planning office and see if they could help you. And there's also probably some diagnostic tests you can take that the career planning office might have on like what's a great thing for your personality. And that can be a fun way to explore. But you're not alone. There's a lot of people who do that. My son just pivoted from a finance major to an IT major. I just want to add, please listen to your gut. Okay, don't try and reason it out. If you have doubts, pay attention. In, honestly, in this day and age, there's so much crossover. Um, in the business world in terms of what you need to know how to do. Um, and finance is kind of one of those really general majors now because you can get into a financial institution, but every financial, I don't, is there another area that you're interested that you're like? Economics. Economics, okay. So they really do have a correlation and you can get your foot in the door with the finance degree. And then just like Sienna was saying, make those relationships in other departments and Rosalie was saying that too. You don't. You, you might start in one department, but you move your way around. Just one more thing. <laughs> okay, so you sound very much like me. Although I didn't question myself my senior year. I said, I'm getting an accounting degree. I'm getting an accounting job. And I was working for UPS at the time. I was 18 when I started with UPS, working uh, part-time at UPS and going to college full-time. I was a commuter. Um, so after I graduated, I was 21 years old, um, I was offered an accounting position at UPS. I actually declined it. And I continued to work in operations because that was my first job. So just like me, um, I, I really didn't want to be an accountant, but my boyfriend was going for it to be an accountant. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do the same thing, no worries. And I did really well at it, but... Um, I think life changes you, and a company like UPS, I mean, I think you should go talk to our HR department <laughs> at, um, after this, because we do have a wide range of professions. We have, like I mentioned to these ladies before, we have engineering, we have supply chain, we have 
economics, sort of, but it fits in, right? It's in the business world, accounting. Um, we have, what else? Oh, business, business, <laughs> business analysis. Is a, yeah, it, it, it's a wide range of um, different professions. You know, of course we have our mechanics and we have our, um, our pilots and we have our truck drivers, but there's so many different opportunities within our company because we're so global and, and, and big that it's just worth a shot. And, and again, it, it crosses over. Everything crosses over, you would believe. I'm actually right now working, um, my main focus is critical healthcare for, for our company. So I'm learning about healthcare and I'm learning about, you know, different, different drugs and, and it's like it's crazy so it, it's always crosses over in life and you just ne don't know so mm -hmm. go with your gut but i think you i really truly think it crosses over and, and you have lots of opportunity thank you ladies <laughs> i want to share too um my undergrad was uh it but there was no way i was going to sit down and be that programmer and in IT, there's so many different aspects, as Rosalie said. I went into business analysis. Even before then, I was actually part of training, the training department. So, you know, looking at different avenues and companies, you could go in so many different directions. So your degree gives you that basis to start with, but there's so many different ways to grow. Right? Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else want to share their story and make a connection? So, um, I sorry, I was sick. So, um, I had a question with relation to like um, interpersonal skills. Um, how do you, how important do you think it is for women in the workplace, and like how do you think you can um, work on it, and, like make it better? Okay. Interpersonal skills. She's the job coach. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's absolutely critical, okay? Um, if you don't have emotional intelligence, no one hangs around long enough to find out your IQ, okay? You need the EQ. However, um, because we're working in a very, very global world <laughs> uh, without borders, you also need to have cultural intelligence. You cannot do business today or you cannot succeed in any job without being both emotionally intelligent and culturally intelligent. Um, you, people without that, without those interpersonal skills, offend other people. And they are not team players. And they can derail and sabotage an entire company. So it is very, very important. And I'm delighted to see how those skills have gained momentum because 20 years ago, no one placed any emphasis on them. And they called them the soft skills. Without those, you can be Einstein. You're not going to make it. Okay, we spoke earlier, um, the world of work is a cruel place. Not everybody is doing what you want them to do. And you have to learn to maneuver that and to be able to come out <coughs> victorious. And only those interpersonal soft skills are going to allow you to overcome so they're absolutely important. And there's a lot of material that you can read on your own. Please remember, um, you're going to leave this beautiful place where you're learning, and there's nobody going to hold your hand and give you material. Find it for yourself. We heard earlier about lifelong learning. Subscribe to that. Uh, otherwise, you're not relevant. Okay, and also just to pick up um, to your question about, um, you know, going into a certain field, 
anyone who isn't multi-skilled and adaptable does not um, accelerate their career at the rate that others do. Before 2008, people specialized in their fields. After the crash, changed fundamentally and forever. You have to have a broad range of skills to be employable long term. I think what's really interesting about your question is um, interpersonal skills is now a big, big focus in a lot of corporations, especially empathy. You know, that's kind of the big buzzword. How can we get everyone to be nice, to be kind, to have that kind of face for the company? A lot of companies now are, are really trying to have like a social impact mission. You also see um, many companies out there and really trying to create a big space in the community so that everyone is, is comfortable. And I think that we, as career people, you can learn a lot about your interpersonal skills by looking at the companies and what they offer. Um, there's a company out there right now called Gender Fair, and their purpose on the web is to have companies that are good for women to work for. Glass Ceiling is another company that does. And so I think uh, as you look into your career and develop your interpersonal skills, think about what you want to develop and then try and find a company that really emulates that. Um, and then there's other tools out there like Hello Career Guru. One of our things is really to help people figure out what training do they need you know, to get to the next step. Potentially, like maybe you might not be a public speaker, but to be in certain careers, you need to be really do that well. So I think I, I would look at companies to kind of see where you can find those good interpersonal skills as well. And there's a place for everyone. Great, thank you. Um, I want to share too, um, my undergrad degree, as I mentioned, was in IT, and the language I learned was COBOL, ancient COBOL programming. And when I finally got to UPS, right, we were doing different types of languages. Now, even though I was not the programmer, I was the liaison between our corporate business users and the programmers. So I went back to school and learned C and C++. Not that I wanted to program. It was for me to communicate with the developers on my team so that when the business users gave us their requirements on what they wanted to do, I wanted to make that transition and be that liaison to the programmer when they say, you know, that's not technically feasible. We can't do that. So we're that liaison. So that kind of training, that's why I believe too, is learning as part of your journey. It's a lifelong journey. Education and learning is something that you will do over your lifetime so that you can work on those interpersonal skills, those technical skills, any of that in your professional and your personal life as well. Okay. Anyone else? I'd like to make a comment. It's not a question. Um, I'd like to thank all of you very much. I agree with every, every piece of advice that this panel has provided. And there's so many directions that I want to go with this conversation. But I would, I, I would want to challenge everybody in this room to eliminate the word failure from your vocabulary. My thinking on this, both personally and professionally, is that if you make a decision with the best information you have at the time that you make the decision, you go forward. You follow your gut. You make your decision. You do the best job you can. And if you then later decide that that's not right for you, you're not a failure. You've just taught yourself something. You've learned from yourself. You've learned from your environment. And you take that information and move on and now change your situation. So I hate the word failure. I think it's horrible. Yes, I failed a second grade math test. I too don't like math. <laughs> but I, have not, I don't think I have ever failed in any of my jobs. I have learned I don't like a particular job and I wanted to move. Fine. I learned about myself, I learned about the job, and I moved on. So I would challenge you all to eliminate the word failure. You're always going to learn. It has to do with mistakes. But sometimes you are not making mistakes. You're making a decision at this moment, and three years later, it's a different, a different decision. Yes, thank you. Anything else? Jennifer?
First of all, thank you so much to all the panelists and the moderator, Rose, for coming out this evening. <clears throat> I, hope. I hope something stuck with you this evening that you can carry on with you because I think it's important to remember these kind of sharing. And I do agree that every single mistake that I have ever, ever made, or not a mistake, or a situation which wasn't perfect, I always came out better for it. And I think that's the, impers uh, the important lesson here. And also, I think learning. It's always about learning. It's never about the journey. It's about the journey, but what you're going to learn. So thank you for reinforcing that this evening, and I appreciate all your time. So come back. Go to HR for UPS. Talk to them about co-op and internship opportunities. Get something to eat. Grab a soda. Connect with some of the speakers. Talk to each other. And thanks again.